Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming and welcome to Memorial Hall. Uh, before I introduce our guest, I'd like to thank the Munson Historical Society for putting on this great event. Uh, now I will introduce Nick, who also happens to be Lord Munson. Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, Munson was inaugurated as a town in 1760, yes? And, it's, and the story goes that the governor of Massachusetts then was a friend of uh, Lord Munson, who was the uh, president of the Board of Trade for the British Empire. However, I've just checked the dates. Uh, his pal had been dead 12 years. <laughs> oh dear. That doesn't mean to say that it still wasn't named after him, it's just maybe the news hadn't arrived. <laughs> There's no email then. Um, the second Lord Munson was uh, possibly even uh, more distinguished politically. He was uh, a member of the Prime Minister's cabinet and uh, he was asked to leave. And they said, um, I tell you what, we're going to raise you in the aristocracy from being a lord to an earl. He said, no thanks. <laughs> anyway, he left anyway. So I th I'm going to tell you about the Munson family after which your great town is named. And, uh, and I'm going to tell you about how we started, and I'm going to take it through the, to, right through th to the medieval times, and um, afterwards to the present day. And, uh, and on that journey, we had all kinds of, uh, an extraordinary new thing happened. We had given a name to an American town, but America started giving a lot to us. But I'm going to start from the beginning. Where did Munson's, where did they come from? Now, if you are very snobbish in, in England and uh, you want to basically say that you're really very grand indeed, you say we can trace our family back to the Normans. And the Normans came in in a sort of a, a quite an unpleasant and trauma traumatizing invasion in 1066. And they pretty much wiped out um, all the Saxon leaders. But before the Normans came the Vikings. Uh, do you all know who the Vikings were? Some of you know who the Vikings were? They were the people with very long hair and they, and they had these um, helmets with horns on them, and um, they had a great interest in English women folk and, uh, and uh, all the gold from the monasteries. And um, they were a pestilential nuisance. Eventually, uh, one of the kings of England, King Alfred, said, uh, look, can we do a deal? And he said, we will give you part of England. We'll just give it to you. And so the Vikings said which part, and they pondered it and said, okay, and the deal was peace, just stay within your borders within England. And the bit of England um, that uh, Alfred gave them was uh, Lincolnshire and part of Yorkshire, and Lincolnshire is where the family come from. All the names in Lincolnshire and a certain part of Yorkshire are all Danish, Scandinavian, Norwegian, Swedish, call it what you will. And uh, our name, Munson, is completely Danish. And uh, where we, all the, the towns and the villages, uh, like for instance, uh, I'll come on to it later, but we, the first title, the inherit, um, inherited title that we received was a baronetcy. And the, and the Munson of the day was Sir Thomas Munson of Carlton. Town of Carl, it's completely and utterly Scandinavian. So, and then uh, his great-great-grandson was made Lord Munson. 
Lord Munson of Burton, again, another Scandinavian name. So to all those people who say where we came from, the Normans, we said we came even earlier, we came with the Vikings. First recorded Munson, they didn't really keep great records back in the 14th and 13th century. There were plagues and people didn't do that much writing and what writing there was um, sort of often got destroyed or lost. But we do have a recording of a, of a Munson in 1375, which makes us a pretty old family. And um, the next time that we, the time that we start to sort of become noted is uh, when the young Henry V decided to go and claim a whole lot of land in France. And uh, he went over on a kind of um, uh, in a raiding party and they went around causing havoc. Um, and they were trying to retreat back to England. The supplies are running short and the, the men had grown tired and they were suffering from dysentery and goodness knows what. And uh, the French army basically cut them off. And the French army was absolutely well, much superior in numbers and they were fresher. And, uh, and they said, we can have a battle with you and you know, England couldn't get out of it. Uh, the person that Henry V relied upon for um, the munitions was John Munson, my direct ancestor. And, uh, and it was his job to make sure that there were sufficient bows and arrows um, and the men were all well equipped and sufficiently well fed. Uh, and um, this extraordinary battle took place when the English against all odds won. And it was all thanks to the longbow and the, uh, and, and the, the extraordinary brilliance of the archers. And the other thing that they had in their favor was uh, it was very wet and muddy. And when the French cavalry charged and the first lot of arrows slammed into the French cavalry, they fell down and they fell down into slightly boggy ground. And so the other horses had to go and jump over them. And, uh, and then more arrows came down and it was, became absolute carnage. Um, the English just completely wiped them out. And it became a very famous battle and it's celebrated in uh, the works of William Shakespeare. So that was back in 1415. Do we hear about any Munsons in the rest of that century? No, but back in the 16th century, um, Henry VIII was going about a sort of a, a revolution in, uh, in Britain. Um, besides sort of um, his extraordinary story with his different wives, um, he was, uh, getting rid of the, all the, uh, the monks from the monasteries. He felt that the church had far too much power and he wanted their money. So um, that's how the, the Reformation uh, came about in Britain. And he needed new men to support him. And the Munsons were chosen as basically the, the leading men of, uh, of Lincolnshire. And Lincoln was then a quite very important um, town is one of the four, fourth, third or fourth most prominent in Britain. So uh, uh, the Munsons rose up uh, in power and there is a, a the story goes was that um, Sir John Munson was invited to be knighted and to be knighted is to, make, to be made a sir. You have to be sort of regarded as being a gentleman. And that was back in 1536. And so the story goes that he and a few others, of the new men of Henry VIII, were called upon to be knighted in a ceremony. And on the same day in another part of the palace, uh, one of the king's wives, Anne Boleyn, was beheaded. So you had an axe falling on the neck of a queen, and you had the, the shoulders of the new men being tapped by a sword. So, the Berlins went down, families, a few families like the Munsons went up, 1536. Now, it wasn't just Sir John Munson. Later on, um, Henry, after Anne Boleyn was beheaded, he 
received a, um, he asked his uh, chancellor at the time um, to go and he said, I, I need a new woman to marry. And he said, yes, yes, uh, your majesty, you do. And I have found the perfect one. She just ticks all the boxes. And uh, uh, she called Anne of Cleves. And, uh, and Henry VIII said, I want to see a picture of her. Now, obviously, this is before, um, you know, uh, the invention of the camera. So they had a, a court uh, painter called Holbein, and uh, Holbein painted a picture of her, but he made her much more lovely than she, in fact, really was. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Henry was absolutely appalled. He, for some reason, he went through with the ceremony, and he said, I, I, just, I can't continue with this. And so um, he agreed to pension her off, and she needed someone to look after her. She was very religious. And uh, he asked amongst his new men, he said, do you know of anyone who can comfort her and look after her? And Sir Thomas Mun Munson said, yes, well, I've, I've, I've got um, my brother. <laughs> Sir John Munson, that's it. My brother Thomas. So Thomas Munson became the companion uh, of the Anne of Cleves for the rest of her life. We then move forward a bit, and uh, we come to uh, this chap called, Sir, he was Sir Thomas Munson, and he was uh, a very fine, good-looking person. And uh, I think this is him just here. <coughs> Sir Thomas Munson. King James liked Thomas, and, uh, and, and Thomas contributed uh, to the royal coffers for a war that they were having in Ireland. And, uh, and the deal was done that anyone who was father or grandfather had been knighted could be made what's called a baronet. And a baronet is like a hereditary sir. So he was the first baronet, 1611. And uh, the title remains with the family. So that's the first of my titles. I am uh, Sir Nicholas Munson, as well as being Lord Munson. He's the first baronet, I'm the 16th. Okay. Um, Thomas, lovely chap, got into a bit of trouble. Um, you tended to hang around those days with people who lived in the countryside nearby you. And uh, I think one of the people he hung around with was a, a rich landed family called the Elvises. Anyway, the Elvises and a few other people um, got involved in some court intrigue. And apparently something dastardly happened. Uh, there was a very saintly man very nice, decent chap called Sir Thomas Overbury. And uh, for some reason, they didn't like Overbury. And Overbury came to a sticky end. You know, Elvis was hanged for it, but for a period of time, um, Sir Thomas was under suspicion. Now, Sir Thomas had just been made keeper of the Tower of London. And he actually... The soldiers came to see him and they said, uh, Sir Thomas, we can't report you. And he said, very good. He said, no, we've got to put you inside <laughs> one of the cells. And uh, so he was basically on kind of on remand, I suppose. At the same time, his brother, who was uh, an extraordinary man, an admiral on the high seas, great friend of Francis Drake took, and Sir Walter Raleigh took part in some extraordinary great naval expeditions. And the word came through from the ambassador, uh, British ambassador in Spain, that, the, um, that some of the, uh, some Spanish commander had successfully bribed Sir William. So he too was put in the Tower of London. The papers went to one of the advisors of James I, a very famous man called Sir Nicholas Bacon, 
very intelligent man. And Sir Nicholas Bacon uh, looked at the papers and he said, no, 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 these, these men are, he said, Sir Thomas is innocent, so he was let out. And as for Sir William, he said, well, maybe he did take a bribe, maybe he didn't, but everyone else has around here, so, you know, he's going to be cleared. So he, he was back on, on naval duty. Uh, Sir William wrote a book called Naval Tracks. Naval Tracks is a, regarded as the first book to be written in modern English. It's an extraordinary book, and he had, and it's really, it was published 80 years after his death, and remained a kind of a, well, he couldn't call it, there wasn't much of a publishing industry, but it was certainly equivalent of a bestseller for 200 years. And the most interesting thing about it is his dedication to his eldest son, um, and he gives advice in beautiful Elizabethan, no, James the first uh, prose on all aspects of life, um, from marriage, advice against swearing, the kind of clothes that you should wear, not to get involved with women who aren't your wife, and um, and he even he had the sort of foresight. He hated tobacco, um, and he said. Uh, People who continually smoke, it dries the brain and they become fools with the use of it. And, uh, and uh, he said that the breath of him that, that takes it is offensive to others. I mean, that was spot on. That was back in about 1620. Back to Thomas Munson. Thomas Munson has um, a few children. In those days, you could have about nine children. You'd be lucky if two survived to 20. So he had two children surviving. Um, one became a great lawyer, and the, uh, and the other was um, quite ambitious. And he spent his part of the family fortune um, rise, raising himself to the nobility, which you could do with a bribe or two in those days. And uh, he ended up as Viscount Munson of Castlemaine. He was the, um, one of the... Uh, he led a very interesting life. He was, um, the Civil War happened, and his brother, the lawyer, advised Charles I on, uh, on the legal aspects of being royal. Uh, and he had to go out, part of his duties was to read the King's speech at Lincoln at the outset of the Civil War, our Civil War. And uh, the war started, you know, it went well enough for the royalists. In the meantime, his brother, the Viscount, was sort of sat on the sides and eventually he came in, not with the king, but with Cromwell. And when Cromwell basically won and Charles I had been executed and Charles II um, was on the run in Europe, Cromwell rewarded uh, the Viscount and said, you can have all the lands and the money of your brother. And the brother was put into exile in Somerset. I know it's not abroad, but if you've been to England, uh, going to Somerset is, feels like being abroad, I can tell you. <laughs> so uh, there he was, uh, high on the hog, doing very well. And then the restoration. Cromwell died, and then there was the restoration. Back came uh, the Charles I's son, Charles II, and uh, obviously he didn't particularly like all those aristocrats who'd sided with Cromwell, and he didn't like Viscount Munson of Castlemaine because Viscount Munson of Castlemaine had actually attended two of the um, uh, the sittings, uh, the court, uh, the trial of Charles I for treason. And just because he attended, he, was, uh, he wasn't executed, but he had everything stripped off of him. And he was put into prison for the rest of his life. And he was, uh, once a year, he was um, taken out in chains from Fleet Prison. And he was marched to the Tower of London and back, being pelted with rotten eggs and tomatoes and being jeered at. And that's how he finished his life, risen to being 
uh, a great Viscount, very rich, and then suddenly the wheel of fortune turns and uh, you know, it's in the equivalent of something like Guantanamo Bay. It was pretty rough for him. So John had all his lands restored and it's from his line that, that I come. And uh, the Munsons were, that's, that's, the Viscount's line died out, so John's flourished, and uh, the royal family looked upon us most favorably. Then in, um, we were owed, apparently the, the feeling was that we were owed and we should just properly come into the aristocracy. This happened in 1728, and uh, John was his name, and, and John uh, became, uh, was quite rich. He had uh, a lot of land, about 15,000 acres in Lincolnshire and large estates elsewhere. And, uh, and he died in 1648. And his son, the, uh, the second uh, baron, as I said, became a, um, a minister. And uh, he refused to take this um, higher movement upwards in the aristocracy to becoming an earl. So that's the second baron. And then you have um, uh, this business, Munson Town here, Bean, uh, in Norgrave, Bean called, called Munson. And I think that. Uh, I think it's likely, on the balance of things, that the, uh, that the governor of Massachusetts had, did have a relationship with, um, with the Munson family. And whether it was the first or the second Lord Munson uh, who was the, the, that was the inspiration for this town to be named after us, I don't know. Further investigation to follow. Okay, now... Um, then there was a uh, moments, marvelous moments in Munson history. We had, um, there was a time when uh, moving on about a uh, hundred years, there was a, a tussle as ever between uh, England and France on the empire. And there was, uh, and uh, anyway, the English managed to win in India against the French. And the, person who did, committed the, I use the French word, the coup de grace against them was Sir George Munson. And Sir George was um, a, uh, a very effective and brave soldier. And he became one of the governors of the East India Company. And uh, he was regarded as being an absolute brilliant general. Now, unfortunately, he had a, he had a nephew, Colonel William Munson, uh, and he came under the Duke of Wellington's command. This was before the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, he was sent northwards with another general, to whom he was actually number two, so the other general really got the, the brunt of the blame. But they were sent northwards to quell some difficult Indians in the Punjab. Now, all of us here know the history of what happens when you go into that area. You know. <sighs> We're talking about Pakistan, we're talking about Afghanistan. People come dreadfully unstuck. Even um, the, the great invader, Alexander the Great, he got unstuck there. And so it was with William Munson. And he went out with a very big force and he came back with about eight people. And uh, the Duke of Wellington heard how the story went and he said he was, he was tricked and deceived at every turn. And he had, he had a fondness for, for Kurt, the colonel, and he said, oh, I said, he's just an unlucky general. And that's where the term first started. I don't know whether you know, Napoleon, um, when he was um, ravaging all of Europe, he said, he said, you know, people say, is this soldier, you know, is he good, is he a good officer, is he a good leader? He said, all I want to know is, is he a lucky leader? So that Munson, unfortunately, was unlucky. His uncle was, well, very, very talented. We move on a bit up to, um, towards uh, uh, 
1890s thereabouts. And this is where um, America comes into our family. Because um, there is this, uh, my great grandfather, uh, when he was out on his travels, met this most astonishingly beautiful woman who was a widow, she called Romain. And uh, there's Romain down there. Uh, I, one of the most extraordinary things was, was me um, knowing that she had this uh, father who was, um, who'd been served in the, for the North in the, uh, in the American uh, Civil War and uh, called Roy Stone. And Roy Stone came from Pennsylvania. He, he was working for his father in Western Pennsylvania where they had a, an estate of about 7,000 acres. And they had a lot of tough lumberjacks working with them. And when Abraham Lincoln made his um, a call to arms, he asked for 75,000 volunteers. Um, Roy Stone went and uh, called up his lumberjacks and said, what about it, boys? And they said, fine. He said, well, I know a bit about soldiering. I think he might have gone to West Point. Anyway, he um, drilled them, trained them. And then they um, cut down some more trees, created some boats. And they went down the river to, um, to as a drilled regiment, to go and report for action and duty. However, when they, <laughs> when they arrived, they said, oh, no, no, we don't need you. You can go back. We've got, we've got quite enough men. And, uh, and the president says anyway that the, uh, this, this little disagreement over Fort Sumter, so it's, it's only the last two, two or three months. So um, Roy Stone suspected his own, he said, well, actually, I'm not sure whether, you know, this, you know, he should be quite so optimistic. Anyway, Roy was right. And, um, and his uh, well-drilled regiment became, um, you know, on the front line and it was, uh, and it became quite feared, I understand. By the, um, by the Confederates. They were very well, well drilled men, sharp shooters, they were tough. And what was interesting I learned doing some further research was that um, when, they, when Roy arrived with his troops, they, they came um, n n not as a proper regiment, uh, they, they came as, just as a group of men of volunteers. And, it's, and they, it's they who decided they had a vote, who's going to lead them. And they, and they chose Roy. So, so these people elected their leader, these soldiers. And uh, anyway, Roy and his, and his men go through a number of different engagements. And uh, some of them, you know, are very tough against the Confederate soldiers. I mean, they were, everyone was extremely brave in those days. And um, uh, come just before the Battle of Gettysburg, um, Roy was told to go and uh, needed fresh men. So by this time, he, he was in charge of three regiments. Um, the 149th, the 140s, these are Pennsylvanian volunteers, 146th and 143rd. And they were all, um, um, many of them had just had never f fired a rifle before against an enemy. Uh, he found himself, uh, he was under the orders of General Doubleday and uh, General Doubleday gave a command to uh, Colonel Roystone, as he then was, and he said, you've got to hold a particular place and you're gonna come under a lot of uh, very, you, you, the fighting is gonna be very difficult. You're gonna be up against superior numbers and you're probably gonna lose, but you must hold out for as long as possible. And Roystone went and 
was very honest with his troops and he said, you know, you, we're going to have to be prepared to, to die for our country. And they all whooped and threw their caps in the air and said, said, if that's what you want, Colonel, we'll do it. They absolutely adored him. And uh, anyway, the, the battle started and he, through a mixture of bravery on the part of his men and trickery, he used trickery to hold the position as long as he could. The thing was is that the, uh, the Confederates were very keen to get the colors of the 149th Regiment who had given them such difficulties in the past. And what he did was he moved the 149th colors away from the 149th and placed them in odd, strange places, kept moving them around. This completely confused the enemy. Anyway, there was, um, eventually the enemy prevailed. Uh, the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg was regarded as a victory for the Confederates. But General Doubleday said, yes, that may be true, but because Roy Stone held the key point, we could all get our f the rest of the forces into position for the rest of the battle. Roy Stone has since been um, commemorated. He has a, a street named after him on the, on the Gettysburg battlefield. And I went to see it uh, the other day and I, and I reread some of the accounts and I must say I was, I was moved to shed a few tears. He was, um, General Doubleday reported, he said it was, you know, the men were extraordinary, very brave. Two thirds of them lost their lives. And he said Stone was battling to the very end and he had a, a bullet in his hip and a bullet in his arm. And uh, somebody the other day gave me one of the bullets found on the, um, on the Gettysburg battlefield. And they're heavy. And uh, they did a lot of damage. Uh, Roy was never really recovered, I don't think, from, from that uh, injury, but he soldiered on. But I think it's been said that once you've had a kind of a, an injury like that, you become instinctively more cautious. You lose your kind of elan and bravado. But when he returned to take up his position again after medical treatment, apparently all the survivors of those regiments cheered him. Um, and uh, he was regarded as a, as a, a great man. And, and my interest in him is in, is in, I don't know, people know about racing horses. You want to, when you want to have a marvelous racehorse, you find parents for that racehorse who are pretty marvelous as well. And I think there's something um, in his spirit which has come through to my side of the family. And as I'll tell you a bit later, I've had a, a few kind of, uh, have been hit by one or two tragedies. And people say, well, you know, how do you do it? How do you carry on? And I said, well, I have the inspiration of Roy Stone. I said, you know, he was, he was made, a, by the way, a general on the battlefield. So he's, he's the man of all my uh, ancestors I probably revere the most. Oh, sorry, one thing I forgot about was uh, the first Lord Munson. Now, we don't know whether this chap... Whether he really was, whether he really was Lord Munson. The problem was that he didn't attach names to the bottom of the pictures. In all our speculations of, of, the, of the different historical pictures that I own, we sometimes give them funny names. And my wife, Silvana, um, refers to possibly the first Lord Munson's bad hair day. <laughs> he does look rather grumpy, doesn't he? <laughs> um, so Roy Stone's daughter marries my great-grandfather and she is uh, conceived 
It is reported on the, I probably, I probably said this wrong, the Potomac? Potomac. Potomac. How do I say it? Potomac. Yeah. Anyway, who knows what, you know, what, who, little did she know what fate was that was going to come to her because she ended up through the Munson connection, she met Queen Victoria. And through Queen Victoria, she met all her, um, all the royal relatives around Europe. And she was seconded to be a senior lady in waiting to the Tsarina of Russia in St. Petersburg. So from Pennsylvania to St. Petersburg. They had a son, uh, my grandfather, 1901 he was born. And uh, he too um, met a spirited and lovely American woman and uh, called Betty. And Betty died just a few years back, at 103. And, uh, and Betty was, was raised in America. She, she spent a lot of time traveling with her father, who was this extraordinary adventurer. I give to you Edward Alexander Powell. Edward Alexander Powell was a, um, uh, started off as a journalist he also worked in um, the American diplomatic service. I didn't quite understand how those two positions could work side by side, but somehow they did. And um, he became a war correspondent. And uh, during the First World War, America, for the first three years, was neutral. Uh, but he wrote these books about the fighting in France, and they were published as articles in America and in England too by the Daily Mail and um, he was he wrote in this very robust way and uh, he was made sure that he had was given plenty of glory in his accounts of what happened but I'm sure that he was actually as brave as he as he said he certainly looks very tough doesn't he um, in 1917, when America joined the Great War, um, he joined, or he came out as being a captain of American intelligence. I don't quite know how, but he must have been somewhere near the front because he got very badly wounded. And uh, anyway, he emerged from the, uh, from the war there and he decided to travel around and send in further reports of adventures around the world. And he wrote about 20 books, and they are um, the titles like By Camel and Car to the Peacock Throne. That was visiting Iran, by the way, meeting the Shah of Persia, as he then was. There's another one called Yonder. Adventure. Stories about um, headhunters in Borneo meeting the Dalai Lama, of whom he had a kind of quite a disrespectful attitude. He called him his dirtiness. <laughs> but he was uh, he, he was he was a tough man, and uh, you know, goodness gracious me, he was my great grandfather, and I certainly sort of was full of, and am full of admiration for him. And he, uh, he wrote a, a book just before he died, a summation of all his, of everything that he'd done. He called it Adventure Road. You can, you can get it on Amazon. <laughs> Betty was uh, a fabulous woman, my grandmother. And she, um, tragically lost her husband, my grandfather, when he was just 51. And then my father inherited, 
uh, at a very young age, 24. And uh, he became a, uh, spent a lot of time in the House of Lords, which he had the automatic right then to enter, and he eventually ended up as the being president of the Society of Individual Freedom. He was always on the lookout, supportive of the small guy, the little man. And um, I revere his memory. Now, on my mother's side, we had some, uh, I thought I just might mention this, we had some uh, very interesting blood. Uh, do many of you know the name Dylan Thomas? Well, I don't know whether you know, Dylan Thomas married a sort of a crazy Irish woman called Caitlin. She drank a lot. She fought. She was not always faithful to her husband. <laughs> Caitlin is my great aunt. <laughs> I've inherited none of her DNA. <laughs> Um, her sister, my grandmother, um, was a marvelous woman called Nicolette DeVas, and she wrote a book again, get it on Amazon, and it's a really good book, Two Flamboyant Fathers. Now, what's, what of the future? What's going to happen now? You see, in the old days, you, there was a kind of a, a system whereby if I didn't produce an heir, it, the title moves sideways along my generation until it drops again to another male heir. Well, that's all finished now. Five and a half years ago, um, I had a son called Alexander was um, picked up by the police uh, under strange circumstances. Uh, and he was taken to uh, the police station and, uh, and he didn't come out alive, he was beaten up. And uh, so there's an investigation been running into this for five and a half years, there's an inquest which is, um, continues to this day. I have um, been campaigning so that my daughter can inherit the, uh, the family title, but I'm pretty much up against a brick wall. But I can continue fighting. Unfortunately, my brothers, my cousins, and I have no male heirs. So as the law is the, uh, the, probably the Munson name gets extinguished. So you're probably looking at certainly the, probably not the last Lord Munson, but the last generation. And uh, anyway, the, the American, oh, one more thing about, um, tell you about uh, Romain. I, think, I, I imagine that, that, the, that the, the American people are, uh, feel that uh, the, the English probably got a lot out of us before they got their independence. And uh, I, I'm, one of the things is I'm very much, I like patriotism, but I don't like kind of nationalistic rivalry. And uh, I think that um, what I want you to know is, is that my, the family joined with uh, Remain in 1912 when there was a terrible tragedy in April 1912, the Titanic sinking. And we didn't lose any members of the family, thank goodness. Um, but we were absolutely appalled about what happened. And uh, she set up this fantastic charity fund for the families of, uh, of those who were lost at sea. And so, actually, about half the months and fortune went to those people. And I think that's a very good thing. Oh, and the final um, piece of interesting history is uh, my great-great-uncle, Sir Edmund Munson. Uh, 
he rose in the diplomatic service to become ambassador to, uh, for England in France. And as I explained, you know, England and France had been bashing each other for hundreds of years. It was just, you know, deep in their blood. They just hated each other. And, uh, and he uh, designed a treaty to say, for goodness sake, it's not our, in our interest to fight every time there's a bit of friction over our respective empires. And he, um, he came up with this treaty, called the, and it was called the Entente Cordiale. And it was basically to get rid of all the areas of friction, because every time something happened, the French press and the English press uh, would encourage the ministers to build battleships, raise armies, and go to war. And he thought this was a nonsense. And as such, we became um, leglocked into friendship with France. And what's interesting is it's been speculated by a couple of historians that were it not for that treaty, England might well have supported Germany in the First World War, and the whole shape of the world would be completely different. So that is the story of the Munsons. One more thing. I'm going to get so the Munson coat of arms. I was rather appalled at, that you don't have one here. So I'm going to um, get one created for you for the town of Munson. Just <laughs> please. Any questions? Yes. You're absolutely right, but, you, but you, in, it was well remembered. The problem was it's only for the royal family, <laughs> not for other title people. I mean, it's not very fair, is it? No, what should be source for the royal goose should be source for the titled gander. <laughs> yes, that, that young lady there, the, the young historian, yes. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. How long have your family been in America? How long has my family been in America? Um, well, on this trip, about two and a half weeks. <laughs> uh, um, my, 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 um, we, we made many visits to America, but what we did was we snatched some of the most beautiful women from America and brought them over to England. <laughs> you better watch out. <laughs> Sorry? Where do you live now? Where do I live now? Um, I live in London a bit, and I also have got a, uh, a guest, a historic guest house. That Savannah, Savannah, stand up so everyone can see you. Go on, I know you're shy. Is this Savannah, my wife? <laughs> Savannah and I have been doing up this um, historic house called Victoria Spa, and we, it was a, an old hotel built to uh, support some natural springs uh, just outside Stratford-upon-Avon, which some of you will know is where Shakespeare was born and where he died. And uh, when we, we bought this house and we looked into the history of it, and we discovered that it was called um, Victoria Spa because Princess Victoria, as she then was when she was 19 years old, came over to stay in the hotel, and, um, and she allowed the hotel to put her personal coat of arms in the gables and in the fireplaces, which we still have. So, and then six weeks later, she became queen of England and its, all its colonies, not America, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> You'd left us. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, unless I missed it, was there any history or stories about the Revolutionary War 
with the Manson family? Uh, <laughs> um, well, the, 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 second, the second baron did make comment, interestingly, I read, and I haven't got to the bottom of it, about a rebellion in 1865 in Massachusetts. Do you know about that? Some of you know about it. So um, we didn't, I, I don't think the, the Munson family had any lands here, so we would have just been, you know, sat back and, and, uh, and, and watched England take a mighty hit. <laughs> We're sorry to lose you. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, I've I've looked it up on the uh, on the internet. Munson, Maine, has got a population of about six hundred and eighty, uh, and and you'll find town as eight and a half thousand. But and they are and, and the two towns there there is a relationship that that they, that the Munson in Maine is named after Munson, Massachusetts, and Dennis here, your illustrious president of your historical society explained um, how that came to be, but I've, I can't fully remember. <laughs> so I have to ask Dennis. Anyone know a good bar in town? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, the, the name, the battle was Agincourt. 1415, yeah. Anyone else want to ask me anything? Yes. Yes. Yes, I, I I don't know. All the all the talk has been about the exhumation of of the uh, of the body of was it Richard the Third found in a car park in Leicester, and 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 that sort of just fascinated everybody. I do know something interesting about about Cromwell. Everyone said, oh, Cromwell exterminated and 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 everything. Well, his son continued to live in North London under a another name, and he was never bothered. Never bothered. And all the, other, all the other people involved with Cromwell were chased and pursued around, the, um, around all of Europe and were assassinated. And he continued to live in North London, so I'm told. Yes, Dennis. Do you have any meetings with the royal family? I have many meetings with the royal family. Well, um, I ha I've met members of the royal family. Um, I was once involved uh, in a charity do for the Commonwealth where Princess Margaret was, um, was our patron and she was given, we raised a lot of money at this big charity event, big dance. And um, I was kind of in my early 30s and the, and, the, and the chairwoman of the committee came up to me and said, Nicholas, do you realize you're the only man on the committee and I said, yes. And she said, well, you're the only man. It's your duty to ask Princess Margaret to dance. <laughs> I don't know whether, whether you know anything about Princess Margaret. She's not the most easy of people. Um, not a sweet woman. Anyway, I, was, I, 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 was, I, I, I did as I was told. And, um, and her, her table was close up to the a wall, so I had to, to ask her, I had to go slide up against all these people looking at me and sort of say, you know, what are you doing here? So, you know, I sort of slid along. And then I eventually I sort of I came up to her and I was so flustered and embarrassed. And I knew that I should um, bow, but I got into a muddle, I did a curtsy as well. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, 
I, I said, uh, your highness, sorry, your, your, your majesty. Uh, and she just looked at me sort of st in a steely way. And I sort of blustered and I said, went red in the face. And I said, it's my duty. No, it's, it's my honor to, to, to ask you to dance with all of you. Because I'm the only uh, male member on the committee. Uh, oh my goodness, what am I saying? And, uh, and she looked at me and said, no, thank you. <laughs> My shoes rather hurt me. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> I felt then, you know, joining the Republican Party, I can tell you. <laughs> my, my, next, my next encounter was, um, again, at a, at a charity event. And uh, it was a time of, um, of the breakup of... Uh, Prince of Wales and Princess Diana. And uh, they, had, they were supporting a charity um, to do with the mentally afflicted. And for some reason, in a rather crafty way, all the senior members of the media from different newspapers had bought the tickets. And none of these people really knew how to behave. And, it, and, it, and, it, and, and I, I was, to this day, I'm sort of really annoyed and upset because there is a protocol that when the, the Prince of Wales and, and his princess get up to dance, after the first dance, everyone joins them. And uh, none of these people knew how to behave. I mean, they may have been dressed, you know, in, properly, but they just didn't know how to behave. So they just sat in their seats and dance after dance. Prince Charles and Princess Diana, as if they're giving a show to us. So I said to my wife, come, this is ridiculous, we're getting up. And for, for the next um, 20 minutes, it was the royal couple, myself and my wife. <laughs> and, um, and I sort of, I, one of the, the few things I'm good at is, is this kind of rock and roll shirocco dancing. So you spin something around, push something down, pull them back. And I thought, I th some devil got into me and I started doing this with my wife, to throw her at Prince Charles and then pulling her back at the last moment. Anyway, so that was my bit of fun. And, the, and, then, and, then, the, and then there was a, a slow number came on, you know. I had to dance like this. So then I was looking into my, my wife's eyes, dancing like this. And suddenly there's this mouth comes up to my ear. And the mouth says, it's cosy here, isn't it? I turn around, my goodness, it's the Princess of Wales. She said, it's cosy here, isn't it? And under those sort of circumstances, you'd think, oh, I'm going to come up with such a witty response and retort. But I didn't. <laughs> I just said, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> and, and my wife at the time interpreted, interpreted it, what Princess Diana was doing, this was completely innocent, saying, God, there's just the four of us on this huge dance floor, as being something else. And... Um, she went, she looked at Diana, I went like this, and she went, <laughs> And I thought to myself, no, no, you've <laughs> got it all wrong. And then Diana just looked her up and down, as if to say, who are you? And, went, ha! and then swung Prince Charles away. And Prince Charles, by the way, during all of this, he was dancing. <laughs> Just wishing he wasn't there. <laughs> so those, those are my, my encounters with the royal family. Any, any other question? Well, oh yes, lady at the end, yes. Yes, I could. The, 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 the position on the hereditary lords uh, has changed since my father's time. In 1999, uh, the Prime Minister, Tony Blair, pushed through legislation saying that only one in ten hereditary peers could um, stand in the, in the House of Lords and the rest weren't allowed in there. And uh, um, I have to find some time to curry favour with one of the parties. Um, to, to get elected, but you only get elected when, 
when one of the, uh, the other lords dies. So you're sort of waiting in dead men's shoes. Um, I, 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 and, and people are living in a long time, and also the, the, the lords don't go and gracefully retire. They don't, they really don't. I, 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 was up, I was up for election a few times, and, and I went in to make a speech, and I thought, oh, I'm gonna sort of, you know, just wow them with my rhetoric. And um, I think uh, of about 24, about eight were asleep <laughs> as I spoke. Um, the average age is about 86, it's quite extraordinary. Um, but uh, who knows? Yes? S sorry, I, I can't. I'm making notes. Well, thank you very much. I'm very honored. OK, well, I'm going to count five, four. You've got to ask anyone to raise their arm in the next five seconds. Otherwise, I'm finished. Five, four, three, two. One, thank you very much. <laughs>